Hello and welcome to Bite Size Newscast number 12. Today I got two topics for you guys. Um, I think these are incredibly important developments in the crypto space, so stay tuned. This is going to be exciting. So first up is the topic of the Bitcoin ETF. Now the central question I'll be answering here is quite short actually. Will we get one? Will we get a Bitcoin ETF? Very interesting topic. A lot of information to digest, so stay tuned for this one. And then next up, not unimportant by itself, the OCC ruling on stable coins. Now, this topic actually has some deeper ramifications that I want to demonstrate to you guys. And I mean, we're going all the way to the central bank on this one. So I'm very excited about these two topics. I can't wait to jump right in. But before we do, some quick housekeeping. Uh, remember, if you like the content or have any questions, please leave a comment down below. Also, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. This way, you'll stay up to date with the most important economic developments as they happen in the crypto and wider economic space. Also, the following is not financial advice. It is strictly educational. So let's jump right in, guys. Let's go. The first topic for today is the Bitcoin ETF. This is major news. It's very important. An ETF for Bitcoin is very important. But before we jump into all this, I just quickly want to go over the concept of an ETF with you guys, just to make sure that everyone knows what an ETF is. And in essence, an ETF is a basket of assets that you can buy on an exchange. In the Bitcoin ETF example, it's a single item in a basket. In many other instances, it's a number of assets in a basket. For example, the S&P 500 ETF contains shares of the 500 most successful American companies. Here's an example, right? Now, contrary to what you might think, buying a share in an ETF does not mean you buy a share of every single company or asset in that ETF. You don't buy a one Apple stock and a Microsoft stock and an Amazon stock. As you can imagine, just looking at these prices, the first three together would always already put you at three and a half thousand dollars for one single share in that ETF. It's not logical. It wouldn't be done, right? Instead, you own a teeny tiny bit of a stock or asset in that ETF. And the size of this allocation depends on the weight within the ETF. And the weight is typically assigned by success. So if you buy a share in the S&P 500 index, you get a larger share of Apple Inc. than you get of, for example, Chipotle, right? Because Chipotle is smaller than Apple. Now, the reason why an ETF is so important is because hedge funds and insurance companies and all these what we would call big money people, they have a mandate telling them that they can only invest in ETFs, right? So you can imagine if we want that kind of money to come into the Bitcoin space, Bitcoin needs an ETF. The current Bitcoin ETF filing was done by Vanek. Right? And Vanek is an investment management firm that has a ton of ETF products. Most of these ETF products specialize in gold and other commodities. And you know what? I think this is a great group to propose a Bitcoin ETF. Uh, they have plenty of experiences launching ETFs. Um, they also specialize in commodities and gold. And as you know, Bitcoin is considered gold. And on top of that, the company is 66 years old. They're legit. Right? So I think this is a good group to propose the Bitcoin ETF, and I'm feeling tentatively positive about it. Now, for those of you wondering, um, an ETF can be set up in multiple ways. You know, some are managed actively, uh, others simply track the price of an underlying asset and buy and sell accordingly. Now, the Bitcoin ETF will be physical. Um, and what that means is that Vanek will actually just go out and buy the Bitcoin outright on your behalf. So if there's 100 people who buy one Bitcoin each through the Vanek ETF, Vanek in turn will go out into the market and buy these 100 Bitcoin. Now, this is tremendously bullish for the price because remember, we're waiting for the big money to come in and the big money only goes in through an ETF. So having a Bitcoin ETF is tremendously bullish for the price. Now, before everyone gets super excited, 
we're gonna have a Bitcoin ETF. Yada, yada. Okay, hold the phone. Hold the phone. What I need to tell you guys is that the Bitcoin ETF has already been rejected nine times. That's right, nine times. The good thing is this was in 2018. And in crypto terms, that's a million years ago. And what I should also note is that in 2019, Van Eck actually wanted to have a go at a Bitcoin ETF. But the good thing is they repealed their efforts because they wanted to make changes to the ETF setup. So the question is, you know, what makes us think that this time will be different? Well, the first reason is that Bitcoin's ETF was rejected for the simple reason the current Bitcoin, I'm quoting here, the current Bitcoin futures trading volume on CBOE futures exchange and CME may not currently be sufficient to support the ETPs seeking 100% long or short exposure to Bitcoin. In language that me and you can understand, this means not enough volume. There wasn't enough Bitcoin volume on the futures exchanges to supplement an ETF. Let's actually have a look at that, just to give you an idea, right? This is not futures volume, but this is regular volume. But regular volume is kind of represented by futures volume. They are reasonably on par, especially when you're comparing two time zones. Now, you can see here 2018 volume. Peak volume was about 10 billion a day. And now we go to now. And we see that peak volume is around about 75 billion, right? That's 75 billion traded in a Bitcoin on one day. 75 billion, okay? Now, I'm no SEC specialist, but to me, this sounds like a pretty big increase from 10 billion to 75 billion. So that's one piece of good news. The third and final reason why I think the Bitcoin ETF is closer than ever is for the simple reason that the person responsible for the other nine rejections Jay Clayton, shout out to my homie Jay Clayton, not really, is um, actually replaced. And he's replaced by someone called Elad Roisman. Now, I am by no means saying that um, Elad Roisman is a crypto proponent. You know, generally he's perceived as friendly to cryptocurrencies in general, but nothing out of the ordinary. If we had Hester Pierce, uh, that would be a different story, but that's a topic for another video. Anyways, um, what I am saying is that the person who is responsible for nine rejections, right, is a lot less inclined to say yes the tenth time. You know, that Jay Clayton has heard it all before. You do nine rejections, you're not probably not going to say yes to the tenth one. It just doesn't make sense. Now, Elon Roisman, on the other hand, might just be open to more innovation. You know, there's a much bigger possibility that with a new SEC chairman, the answer might be yes, right? And Vanek knows this, and that's why they're timing it now. It's perfect timing on their part. All right, so to recap, to, to put it all together, a Bitcoin ETF looks to be a lot closer. It's Nobody knows if this will be the final step, if Vanek will actually get it done, but what we can't say for certain is that this timing is immaculate. It's done by a big group. There's a lot of institutional demand for it. So we're definitely one step closer, right? Now, we can also say that Bitcoin has matured a lot since 2018 and will continue to do so. You know, it isn't just that, that, that explosive growth and then that collapse and then nothingness. No, it's come back. It's matured. It's grown. The environment has grown. The... Uh, institutional demand for it has grown and the SEC will see that make no mistake about it and I believe very strongly that we'll see a Bitcoin ETF in the future and when that happens expect the price for Bitcoin to absolutely explode next topic the OCC which is the Office of Comptroller of the currency has sent out a letter clarifying that U.S. banks are now allowed to use stable coins to settle transactions. 
On top of that, they are allowed to function as nodes for a stablecoin network. This is big news. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to cut a cord through it. It's big. Um, similar to the uh, Bitcoin topic, uh, I want to explain something to you guys before we jump in, and that is who is the OCC? Well, uh, the OCC, in essence, is um, an independent bureau within the Treasury Department, and they regulate and supervise all the American banks. Now, the aim of the OCC is to provide um, a regulatory environment in which banks can issue new products and services, and they are also responsible for making sure there is no shenanigans in uh, the banking space. Now, <clears throat> to have a bureau as such issue a statement on the use of stable coins is big news. Now, the reason being that it provides banks with the ability to bank stable coins and to offer stable coin services to its providers. Now, what should be noted is the fact that many of these stable coins run on public blockchains like Ethereum, right? So it stands to reason that the legitimization of stable coins and the ability for banks to run nodes and ultimately offer stable coin services to their providers and their customers is exceptionally good news for public blockchains overall and especially for uh, Ethereum. Now actually let's 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 have a look at what the federal uh, charter actually says. Now, this part I, I highlighted, and for those of you listening, let me just read it out. While governments in other countries have built real-time payment systems, the United States has relied on our innovation sector to deliver real-time payment technologies. Some of those technologies are built and managed by bank consortia. Some are based on independent node verification networks, such as blockchain. Now, I think this is a very interesting little snippet here because it demonstrates the different ideology towards innovation and in this case blockchain digital currencies. Now what I mean with this is the US very much wants its private sector to innovate this space and this is very contrary to China for example who chooses to issue a national version of the central bank currency. Now the American interpretation of letting the private sector do it um, leads from the idea that the private sector will ultimately have the best product. It's like a little match for who has the best product will ultimately come out of the private sector as the most successful. And in turn, for the government, it's the oversight, rulings, laws, legislations which in a private sector can innovate fairly. And that's the responsible for uh, responsibility for government. China, on the other hand, is taking a completely different approach. They're saying, we're going to have no competition. We want control over this. You know, we want to do this right from the get-go, and we want to have the government back this up, right? So it's a really big difference in ideology, which I think is very interesting uh, to think of conceptually. Now, returning to the topic of the stable coins. Some people in the community would argue that this is very bullish for Ethereum especially. The reason being that the Ethereum network is the largest stablecoin settlement network as it stands. And with the quote-unquote floodgates for stablecoins being opened, they argue that it will increase the adoption of the Ethereum network and with adoption an increased price. Now, personally, I'm very torn on this because the assumption here is that banks will use public blockchains for settlement, but there's no guarantee they will. You know, in my opinion, I'm 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 actually quite bullish and bearish on this news at the same time. You know, bullish in the sense that if Ethereum is used in the settlement layer, it will lead to widespread adoption of the network. And actually, if we look at this chart here. Um, we see that stablecoin settlement on chain have increased dramatically in the last three years. Now, for those of you listening, I'm looking at a chart of uh, stablecoin volume. 2017, it's 13.5 billion, and in 2020, 
it's over 1 trillion. That's a big increase. Very big. Now, once again, most of this gets settled on Ethereum, and if this continues, it's very good for Ethereum. But the same time, like I said, I'm, I'm also bearish because banks choose their own blockchain and settlement layers. You know, like JP Morgan has JP Morgan coin. So it may not lead to any adoption at all. And actually, it may even drive adoption away from Ethereum. So, like I said, I'm, I'm both bearish and, 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 and bullish on, on the news. Oh, actually, another reason why this news leaves me bearish is because it, it doesn't cover any digital assets. It just says stable coins and, st and, 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 and stable coin volume. There's nothing on other digital assets. In other words, this legislation does not allow banks to bank Bitcoin directly. And I think that's actually a missed opportunity for the OCC to provide banks with the opportunity to compete with DeFi and uh, the likes of BlockFi, for example. Now, the reasoning behind permitting stablecoins is pretty solid. Uh, let me read it out to you guys. Um, like ESVs, which are electronic stores of value, stablecoins can serve as electronic representations of US dollars. Instead of value being stored on an ESV card, like a credit card, the value is represented on stablecoins. This distinction is technological in nature and does not affect the permissibility of the underlying asset. Now, the reason I wanted to focus on this is because of the last bit, the permissibility. Now, I think this is the key component of where legislation fits in in the grand scheme of things. Now, in essence, I think the recent success of Bitcoin and other digital assets has gotten a lot of attention. You know, make no mistake about it, people are watching Bitcoin. Everyone knows the price and has an opinion on it, you know. It also has gotten a lot of attention from central banks lately. I think they are truly becoming to understand that if they don't get this beast under control, this Bitcoin beast, this Ethereum blockchain beast, at some point it might eat them. And you can see, you know, they weren't as afraid when the when the Bitcoin price went to God knows 20k in 2018 because it dropped back down, right? But now Bitcoin has come back and it's come back stronger. It's come back with a vengeance, so it's definitely on the radar for the central banks. And um, let me actually demonstrate that with this short clip. Hold on, let me switch. Uh, let me switch the settings so you actually hear the recording. One moment. Now here is Christine Lagarde. Hope I didn't butcher her name. And she is the president of the ECB. And this is a short snippet on what she has to say about um, Bitcoin. So tune in. It is a speculative. It's it's a speculative asset uh, by any account. I mean, when you look at the at the most recent developments upward, and now the most recent downward trend, it's it, for those who had assumed that it might turn into a currency. Terribly sorry, but this is an asset, and it's a highly speculative asset, uh, which um, which has conducted some funny business and some interesting and totally reprehensible money laundering activity. Uh, I think. All right, so she's talking about some funny business and um, money laundering. Which actually, let me get into that real quickly before we, we carry on. Now, the reprehensible, reprehensible business in money laundering the president of the European Central Bank is talking about is, of course, what countries like Iran and North Korea have been up to lately. And these countries, as you might know, um, have some pretty crazy sanctions on them. Well, not crazy as in, like, I don't think they're legitimate, but I mean, they're pretty significant. And they're using Bitcoin to actually avoid these sanctions. You know, and on top of that, um, in the wider world, there's been some significant reports that Bitcoin is being used as a means of avoiding taxes. And I think this scares central banks. You know, central banks, governments, uh, fiscal authorities, you know, essentially they have no problem with people owning and using Bitcoin or any other digital asset. You know, they welcome the innovation that this brings to the fiscal space, to the financial space. And what they do have a problem with, however, is it encroaches on their power. 
you know you have to realize that central banks are amongst the most powerful institutions if not the most powerful institutions in the world can you imagine being able to print money like having infinite money that's the kind of stuff aladdin would wish for or i would wish for if i was aladdin you know and this ability to print money and the power that comes with it you want to protect it right i mean you'd protect it i know i would protect it but what does this protection look like what's well, it's you can't ban bitcoin out bitcoin outright it would cause an uproar what you want to do is you want to kind of clamp down on it slowly like a constrictor right and the way this starts uh, in this example is with know your customer laws and ironically so know your customer laws is basically if you want to engage with any client or any person trading in bitcoin and you want to send out bitcoin to the bank the bank wants to know who you are now in the long run i think that's actually a good good thing right the, the first step is a good thing you know having extra know your customer longs is a is a great way of legitimizing the space right um but what it does in terms for the ecb is it sheds light on the participants in the bitcoin network uh, it'll bring light to who owns which wallets and conduct businesses with who and who. Now, if central banks and monetary authorities can figure this out, they will appease their personal short-term desires to get some form of control over the space. Now, what happens after this is anyone's guess, right? But it stands to reason that over time they'll induce more and more laws that just make it more and more difficult to own Bitcoin, to trade Bitcoin, to store Bitcoin, it are going to slowly constrict around a space. Now, make no mistake about it. This is still all up for grabs, right? No, this, nothing has been set in stone. So it's going to be very, very, very interesting to see how European central banks, all the central banks around the world, are going to slowly issue new statements and legislation that will either constrict Bitcoin or smear it in another way. Oh, by the way, before uh, we actually close this topic, I want to leave you guys with one little snippet on this topic. Now, uh, Danielle DiMartino Booth is a person who worked for uh, the central bank. And um, she's she has a pretty keen insight on how financial institutions work and uh, I sent her out a tweet on this video and uh, actually I sent a tweet on this video the one on uh, ECB and I basically asked her like do you think this is going to be a problem for Bitcoin you know is this a negative for the Bitcoin asset and she says I was never said that I was referring to the blah blah, blah. okay so she says it's not actually a bad thing for Bitcoin, which is kind of confusing, right? On the one hand, I'm thinking, okay, they're slowly constricting this, the, 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 the Bitcoin space. And uh, this person who used to work for the Federal Reserve is telling you, no, it's not like that. So it's as much as I want to be, I don't want to be right. Actually, I want the Bitcoin space to be in a free open world. But the point I'm trying to get across to you guys is that I feel and I sense that we're getting slowly constricted. The Bitcoin space is getting slowly constricted. But um, on the other hand, there's people out there thinking it's not the case. So, you know, I, I'd love to hear you guys your opinion on it. You know, what, what do you guys think? Like, wh what is your engagement with the Bitcoin space? Do you think the European Central Banks are going to constrict the space? Or are going to let it flourish? Or is there going to be some, some path in the middle, maybe? What do you guys think it, it'll look like? Anyways, I want to thank you guys so much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed the content. Uh, I put a little bit more effort into this video than other videos in the sense that I did a little bit more research. And I really think this is a nice uh, angle to approach uh, Bite Size from now on. So expect to see fewer topics uh, per video, but deeper dives in every video. So once again, thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the content. Please subscribe and I'd love to see you next time. Bye.